Today's segment of Sound Balming is brought to you by Jimmy and Mary's Authentic Body Care. I cannot express to you how much we love, love, love their products. Although we use them all year, as the weather gets colder, we need these products even more. The dreaded drop in temperature, the dryness, the itchiness, and the unnecessary flakiness is inevitable. Shea Butter from Jimmy and Mary's Authentic Body Care is the only thing that works for my skin and hair needs. Not only do these products cure my dry skin, the whipped butter goes on smoothly and doesn't leave that uncomfortably thick, sticky residue. Bonus? It smells absolutely amazing. There are so many different scents to choose from too. Not only do they carry skincare products, there are products for authentic living, face, shower, hair and beard, spritzers and perfumes, and bath products. Let me tell you, we cannot even keep the stuff in the studio. The entire production team, as well as all our children, use Jimmy and Mary's product. Jimmy and Mary's take pride in creating quality, handcrafted products from simple ingredients for the entire family. Their products are made for all skin types and are 100% handmade, 100% vegan, and 100% cruelty free. Skin care is important. Moisture is key and keeping our skin and hair hydrated is essential. I cannot emphasize how much we trust Jimmy and Mary's for all of our skin care needs. Hurry on up to JimmyandMary's.com and check out their products. Did I mention service is fast and efficient too? Don't forget to mention that you heard about Jimmy and Mary's authentic skin care on Sound Balmy. Use the discount code soundbalm20 to get 15% off. That's soundbalm20 for 15% off at Jimmy and Mary's Authentic Skin Care. Hey everybody, welcome to Sound Bombing. I created this show for people who want to experience a radical, life-changing journey through the sounds of my diverse guests. I hope that each sound you hear on this show will strengthen your faith, encourage your dreams, and challenge you to awaken the greatness within you. Drop the bomb. Drop the bomb. We're going to drop the bomb. We're going to drop the bomb. We're going to drop the bomb. This is a journey into sound. A journey which along the way will bring to you new color, new dimension, new values. And a new experience. Ladies and gentlemen, the star of the show, Lamar Darnell Shields. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever the time of the day it is. Welcome to my show. I'm your host, Dr. Lamar Darnell Shields, the creator of Sound Bombing. And my goal with this show is to introduce you to people with ideas that will help you unlock your full potential. Now, the murder of George Floyd forced many American companies to reckon with racial inequality in ways few had before. After years of passivity or even contribution toward inequity, companies didn't know how to respond. Just a couple of months after trimming their DEI programs, companies were scrambling for guidance. Pressured by customers and their own employees, a lot of companies seemed to feel like they needed to say something. Their need to be out front of a national social movement meant they were proclaiming themselves allies. They made pledges, promises, even bulleted list of goals. But if you ask any company whether they're diverse and inclusive, and they're probably going to tell you yes. After all, not many hiring managers would want to admit that they have trouble recruiting or retaining members of diverse backgrounds. And if you take that answer at face value, you run the risk of joining a company that talks a big game, but ultimately fails to take action. And in a worst case scenario, this results in anyone from non-traditional background feeling isolated and uncomfortable at work. But you don't have to wait until you've accepted a position to figure out whether or not companies walk the talk, even when it comes to sexual preference, race, religion, 
or gender. The interview process is an opportunity not only for a company to get to know, let me go back, but you don't have to wait until you accepted a position to figure out whether or not a company walks the walk when it comes to sexual orientation, race, religion, or gender. The interview process is an opportunity not only for a company to get to know you, but for you to get to know the company. And there are a number of questions you ask that will help you shed light on their commitment to equality and inclusion. So what actually should you ask? And what companies do to promote, or what should companies do to promote diversity and inclusion? Great question, you know, and I have the answer. You know what? Well, not me. I don't have the answer, but today's guest does. He has dedicated his life to closing the diversity and inclusion gap. He describes himself first and foremost in human terms, a husband, father, and grandfather, a brother and advisor, but professionally, he is an, also an exp expert on diversity and inclusion strategy, a risk mitigator, and a tremendous speaker, an amazing speaker, I must say. He wants all of us to take a closer look at diversity and inclusion. Then what we may have heard from training exercises that simply check off boxes and he isn't afraid to challenge people to have conversations that push them out of their comfort zones. As a human capital strategist, focus on the art of recruiting diverse talent using various creative methods. He celebrates uniqueness and encourages diversity, build global mindset. He tells stories about culture and most importantly, to educate the world about the beauty in all of us of how we can work together to improve our global identities. He has put his heart and soul into bringing talent to corporate America. He's appeared on many, many shows. Karen Hunter's show. He's participating in Top Recruiter Four Season, Reign of the Bosses, which I got a chance to check out my man on that trailer and was selected, yes, as the winner because we only bring winners onto this show because like DJ Collins said, all I want to do is win, 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 more now to what? Come into the stage and come into the Sound Bomber studio is my man, Torin Ellis. Torin, brother, welcome to Sound Bomber. Absolutely. And I know that there's some applause somewhere up in that joint. I appreciate, I absolutely appreciate the way that you've set up the conversation that we're going to experience. I appreciate the kind words that you've given me about my personal as well as my professional life. I appreciate that you do what it is that you do and how you show up in your personal and your professional life. I just got to say, and the last thing that I'll say, and let we get, let us get into the conversation. I know the David Lamar Shields from way back. And so this is not just a thing that you've been doing recently. This is who I know you to have always been and probably will continue to be until you hit that chapter of life where you say, I'm going to pause. But for now, let's put in this work. I knew you when you had hair, brother. That's on, how man. deep we go back. Come on, man. Come on. <laughs> I knew Let's him before go. the little gray came into the into the. Fa I knew you before you walked across that TV screen. But what I knew about you is I knew that you were great. I knew you were bound for greatness. And what I love about you, you're always consistent. You and 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 you work with everybody. And you know sometimes, Torn, when people get invited to the White House, when they get invited to MSNBC, CNN, Fox, when they get invited to BET. When they get invited to all of these shows, they they tend to change. But your your walk has always stayed upright. Your handshake has always stayed firm. You've always checked on my family and my children, and you've always been consistent. And so when you hit me up a while ago about this TV show that you're going to be a part of, I was like, listen, you've already been prepared and you've already won it because you are a winner. But man, now you and I are connected at a different level, man. We are in the diversity and equity and inclusion space. My work is very similar to yours. I focus a lot on schools because that's my sweet spot being an educator. I know how to stay in my lane. Eventually, I'm going to get that corporate money. I know that corporate money is deeper than this education money. But the reality is you're doing the work. Let my listeners know where you're calling in from. And we like to do a mental and spiritual check in. Let us know how you're doing. I absolutely feel wonderful, you know, um, rejuvenated each and every single day, prepared to fight. You know, we say we rest as lions and we wake up as warriors and we're ready, absolutely ready to chase down whatever the day brings in front of us. And each and every day is different. And you actually made uh, a reference to something. I am going to continue to work with everyone. I have black and brown friends that say, well, why are you fighting for a seat at their table, a table that they 
control that they created because that's what inclusion is all about. You understand? If we're going to do diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, for me, that's what inclusion is all about. I understand that crop of people who say, well, integration was the thing that really uh, watered down and it weakened our communities. I get it. That was in 1960. And that may be the case for some, but I feel like if we work with an integrated spirit and philosophy that we can build better communities, we can build better schools, we can build better corporate quarters, we can absolutely build and do that building together. Now, I'm not sitting up here saying that I'm a pacifist and that I'm going to cajole or, or work really, really hard to bring racists along in the conversation. That's my cut card. But if it's a person who doesn't necessarily know, they're not sure what being an ally looks like, they have some reservation about this old meritocracy thing. I, I get it. And I'm willing to work with an individual who's genuine. So how do I feel? I feel encouraged. I feel in, uh, invigorated. I absolutely feel that we are going to make progress, but I also feel like I'm moving with a bit of pause and accountability because we had a whole lot of stuff happen after George Floyd and not a lot of that has been realized. So it takes people like me to continue to agitate. So I know you in another world, but you've always had passion. When did you develop your passion for this work? Yeah, it happened. Literally, I can almost see the day in 2011. Quick story for the audience. I have been in the recruiting space since 1998. And what I saw going through the bubble of 2001, when Internet companies were folding, the economic collapse of 2008, where it caused havoc across the country, coast, coast to coast, border to border. In 2011, as we were exiting that, I said to myself, I want to be in this human capital, this talent acquisition. I want to be in the people space, but I want to be in the space differently. Doing transactional recruiting is cool. It's lucrative. I mean, very lucrative, but that's not, I don't feel, I don't feel like I'm, I'm, I'm really being who I want to be. And, and money has never motivated me. What motivates me is something entirely different. And so in 2011, I had an experience and I won't go into the detail, but I had an experience that really made it crystallized for me that someone needed to do something different around the narrative of diversity and inclusion. Now, over the years, I've grown to say diversity, equity, inclusion and belonging. But in 11, it was somebody's got to do something different. This narrative around DNI, in many ways, it's punitive. White men are being beat up on, white folks are being beat up on, white women are being beat up on. And on the other side, it's tiresome. Black folks are tired of having a conversation. I'm not a uh, Hispanic or Latin or a person with a disability or in the LGBTQ community. So I couldn't speak for them, but I knew black folks were tired of having a conversation. We needed to have a different conversation. So in 2011, I said, I'm going to be the guy that's going to do it. And in having that conversation from stages across the globe, working with clients and understanding how do we change the narrative around DNI so that we have a more solid process integrated in our organizations. So before we move a little further, I want to I want to pause right there. I want you to talk about your definition. So what is your definition of diversity and inclusion? And then how do you then encourage people to honor the uniqueness of each individual? Because a lot of times when I'm doing the work, I'm, I'm my work is in around equity and I have to pause like you, Torin, and I have to pause to actually give them what this definition is because we have this different definition of equity and equality being the same thing. Now I'm working with schools, school leaders across the country. Now I'm working uh, in the art world, working in a magazine. I mean, not the magazine, but the museum world and many of them are struggling just as well. Before we go any, any deeper into the conversation, what is your definition of diversity and inclusion? Then how do you encourage people to honor the uniqueness of each individual? Yeah, for me, it's convening the unfamiliar, the unknown and the unusual aligning on a mission, unafraid of our differences, period. And so it really is something that says all of us are in that definition of diversity. Like one of the reasons why I have so much success in the work that I do is because I make sure that we lay the foundation and have conversations that keep white men in the room and not running for the exit door. Not that I need their approval, but I need them in the room. We got to we got to be honest with the fact that, yes, in many, many instances, they are the ones that are in power. They have the control. They have access to the resources and they are the person who can dole those out. So to ex uh, extricate them or to push them out of the room, 
that defeats the purpose of what we are trying to do. So I want people to understand you are in that unfamiliar. You are in that unknown. You in some way are in that unusual. And we can bring all of those audiences together, aligning on a particular goal, a particular objective, a particular mission, so that we can move forward unafraid of, but embracing the differences that we bring to the equation. What would you then say are some of the consistent mistakes that you see companies making when they try and work on issues of diversity and on issues of equity? Um, I, I think, uh, you know, and in no particular order, um, no particular order, let me just say, um, I think the first thing is that they, they don't recognize how much, how complex this issue is and how much it's going to take or what it's going to take to right their individual ship. No company is the same, but across company, everyone's formula for how we do this work better is different because there are a number of moving parts. And I don't think that leaders and leadership recognize and give enough credence to we are different and it's going to take more than just simply lip service. So the first thing is around commitment. The second thing that I think um, if, if I saw uh, consistent themes, I would think that we have a number of people in position that are not competent or capable. So emotionally, a lot of folks were charged up to do DNI work after George Floyd for whatever reason. They got charged up. It was the catalyst for them, be it a white person, black person, person with uh, a disability, someone coming from the LGBTQ community, Muslim, uh, Republican, Democrat. It doesn't matter to me. George Floyd was an ignition for a lot of people. Well, just because emotionally you are connected now for whatever reason, that doesn't mean that you have the competency. Doesn't mean that you have the capability. Doesn't mean that you have the bandwidth. And so I think a lot of these programs, these initiatives, these efforts, these uh, plans in these organizations are being led by people that are not as competent and capable in this work, maybe a virtuoso in their role, in their discipline, but not so much so in DEIB work. That it's would be the second thing. It's interesting that you would say that because, so again, my space is typically the education space. And so just like you, you and I would even pass each other in the airport. We were talking about, this is pre-COVID. We were flying all over, driving to these different places. Then all of a sudden, Torin, I'm seeing people that's in my space. I won't name them. And they had this certain frame of reference of work that they focus on. Then all of a sudden, it was like they they put a sign on their door that I'm the DEI, X, DNI expert. Like first you were working with this group, you're working with that group. Now you want to become this expert. And then it really, really blew me away because I was looking at some of this stuff and I love many of these people and I'm not trying to be all things to all people. And so it was easy for me to pivot into the space because the bulk of my work was sitting around black and Latino boys. And I was already doing that work. So then when I discovered, man, this is this is a, this is a conversation around equity versus equality and 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 vocabulary that I wasn't even using, but it was some vocabulary I was very familiar with. So let's go a little deeper into that space, because, again, I think a lot of times people are doing more damage to uh to this field because they're just popping up into the space and say now i'm the dei expert now now i'm the now i'm the now i'm the equity expert now i'm the diversity and inclusion expert you know what do you have to say to those individuals who are then sort of pivoting and also damaging the field let me try to put a book in on that so on one side i had a conversation this is a real story a couple of months ago it may have been four or five months ago at this point i can't remember but uh, a young man reached out to me on LinkedIn, back channel, hit me with a message and said, Torin, I need a bit of guidance. Got on the phone with him because I sent him a calendar link and said, look, let's wrap. We ain't going to go back and forth. Let's just get 15 minutes on the calendar. He shared with me that his company had tapped him on the shoulder to lead the ERG efforts in the organization. ERG, the acronym stands for Employee Resource Group. Some might know it as a business resource group. Um, they got a couple of other acronyms, but basically that's when people come together because they have a shared interest in that organization. Cool. They tapped him on the shoulder to lead the ERG. I asked him two questions. I might've asked more, but I said, number one, um, how long have you been with the organization? He said a year. I said, number two, what makes you feel you are the right person to do this? He gave me a response at the end of the conversation, short story. You ain't the one. 
<laughs> and I told him, you ain't the one. That's like a hip hop song. You ain't the one. <laughs> you ain't the one. You ain't the one. And so I, what was revealed in that is that there was a subculture in that organization that actually people that had been there for five, seven, 10, 15 years had a sub ERG. Like they were already meeting. And so what I said to him was, well, if the folks with the tenure, the cachet, the panache, if they're already meeting and they can't get stuff done, what makes you think after one year of being in the organization, you got the pull and the strength to be able to get things done? You are going to do more damage to the DNI work in the organization than good. That's on one side. On the other side, had a conversation with Karen. You mentioned Karen Hunter. Had a conversation with Karen uh, ju- last week of July, just a couple of, uh, of weeks back. And one of the things she asked me was, well, why are you going to be a part of the crop when, when it's all said and done? I said, because I'm authentic. White folks know when they bring me in the organization exactly what it is that they're going to get. And black folks know it too. So I'm not a person who's a shrinking violet. I'm not here to coddle and make any audience feel good because the culpability of why we are where we are rests in all of our sandboxes, some more than others. The reason why San Francisco G'd off the way that they did over the last 30 years is because we messed around and didn't hold them accountable. We didn't vie for the access. We didn't demand the access. We were okay with just covering the story and reporting on the unicorns. We weren't pressing them before 2013. We weren't pressing them in early 2000. Wait a minute. What's your hiring joint? We, as, as black, we weren't pressing them enough. Our HBCUs and presidents weren't pressing them enough. The media, black entertainment, television, and rolling out magazine, we weren't pressing them enough. We were cool and happy talking about Twitter and talking about LinkedIn and talking about and talking. No, we weren't pressing them. So the responsibility, yes, is on that founder to have a program or a process in place, an interest in place that says, We don't need to only recruit from Ivy League schools. We should be going at Hispanic serving institutions and relationships with uh, organizations that support the blind and folks that have autism. We should be pressing them, but we weren't. So when I say I'm not a shrinking violet, yeah, I'm going to give white folks the work, but I'm going to give it to black folks, too. Yeah. And I and I and I believe I believe in it that that's so important because I know as I approach the work with my partner, what's what's interesting um, so my partner is, is a white female. I need to say that. So when we come into the space, people feel a little more comfortable, person of color and then a, then a, then a, then a white female. But what she's what, what I've learned from Marina, her name is Marina. She said when she is the minority in the space, when she is the minority, she says she listens more. But she when she's in the majority, she speaks more because she typically spends a lot of time with the majority. And so she's able to articulate some of those messages. Do you feel when you come in as a male of color? And a, and a, and a, and, a, and, a, and not a small dude, but a male of color. We talk about stature. We talk about voice. We talk about where you come from. Do you feel that there's some level of in, uh, in, intimidation from the people that's in the room, black, white, or brown people, when you come into the space because you are you are part of the marginalized group? And you, how dare you speak up for that group? It should be somebody else who's actually might have held that group down. Do you ever feel that pressure as a facilitator? And if so, then how do you sort of pivot that or maybe use it to use it as a tool uh, to then be be a stronger facilitator? Yeah. And back to your example of Marina, what I say in that instance is Marina is lending her privilege. Mm. You know, she's allowing you, Darnell, to get in the room and she's lending a bit of privilege or she's she's I just I love her 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 dynamic of how she shows up and and moves through these conversations. As and she'll to- say, and she'll say in the session, it's almost like we're passing the baton. Here you take it from here. I'll be like, I got it. It's like when you you know you watch wrestling, you like tag me in. Yeah. So so we so we've learned that we've we've learned that. But I've heard other organizations that don't have quote unquote diversity within the organization then they don't people sort of tend to them to look at them in a different way. So I do appreciate yeah. that. Yeah, a- absolutely. And and I'm just not one of these people that subscribe to the, the to the general 
or to the blanketed notion that white people can't be involved in and be helpful and beneficial to the DNI conversation. I'm not a guy who subscribes to that as it relates to intimidation. And do I feel that I don't typically feel that. Um, but I think part of it for me is kind of how I set up my meetings, you know, whether it be a discovery call, whether it be an introductory call with an individual or a group of people from said organization or said company, I, I tend to kind of lace that initial engagement with me with two words. And I say this often and have been saying it for years. Two of the most powerful words in the lexicon are love and process. That if I love you, Dr. Lamar uh, uh, Shields, if I love you, then you are not really questioning what did I say? Why did I say it? If I push you out of the way and you know that I love you, you're probably assuming more often than not that Torn pushed me because I'm he he's protecting me from something or it's just a love. It's not a big deal. When you know that love exists, then we're cool. If you don't know that that love exists, well, then now I got a process. Why did he say that? Why did he say it that way? Why did he use that tone? Why was his cadence that way? Why did he push me? Why? It's a whole bunch of whys. And so now we have to get in that gray area of how do we come out of that processing? How do we exit out of that thought, that cycle that we were going through What for whatever it was that Torrin said or Lamar Shield said or Marina said? Love and process to me are two of the most powerful words in our lexicon. So I share that, seed my conversations with that where folks are not really feeling intimidated. Really, the intimidation comes not so much so as a black man. The intimidation comes because a lot of people feel, wow, I really don't know what the freak I'm doing. Mm. Or, damn, we just did this. And now after talking to Torn, we kind of realized that that was not the right way to go. Or we as an organization probably should be further along. Or the intimidation will come because we know we have a history of saying certain things, but our activity hasn't lined up with that. And Torrin is going to hold us accountable. So the intimidation tends to come merely through the work and not so much so through my presence. So then with that being said, what would you say to the human resources director who doesn't understand why diversity is necessary for the workplace? I'm going to say that you don't need to be in human resources. Like you need to find another discipline. If you as a human resource person don't understand the value of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, you are in the wrong capacity. If you say to me, you don't understand how to do it better, that's different. But if you say, I don't understand the value, I don't understand why the company is making such a declarative statement on such. If you hold that position, you don't need to be in human resources. Let me give you an example. We, over the last couple of years, have had a big conversation around Me Too and Time's Up. Here's what I say to them. The only reason we had that conversation is because we had too many people in human resources that cared more about the company and not the individual. Full stop. Like, if I'm a woman, and I am lodging a complaint against individuals or an individual in my organization. And in more often, more cases than not, that information was swept under the rug. Those emails were put on silent and filed away in a folder. In one instance, we had a person, this is not me too, but I have a story of uh, one of the shipping companies in Ohio where a person was dealing with a racial um, racially charged incident, picture of a noose hanging in the facility. The people took that complaint to security, not to human resources, to security. And security said, it ain't really a big deal. The fact that we even have that dynamic happening and HR is not getting involved and making a big deal about it, human resources, in my opinion, has been sleep at the wheel. Now, listen, you ain't got to believe me so for your listeners out there who don't know Torrin, who don't necessarily, because I don't rock in the human resource space, human resources is different than talent acquisition. I come to this work as a TA professional, as a practitioner, but Josh Burson did a uh, report earlier this year in March. Josh Burson, B-E-R-S-I-N, he did a report in March of this year. The number one skill 
that human resource professional said was a place where they needed additional development, support, preparation, whatever, was diversity and inclusion. Mm. He ain't interviewing HR folks from small companies. He's interviewing HR folks from all across the spectrum, small, medium, large, industry agnostic, geographically located, all across the board. Number one skill that HR folks were struggling with, DNI. How do we do it better? So the, the response that I give to you is if they are questioning the value of, of representation, of inclusion, of equity and equality, then they don't need to be in human resources. So we want we want to go back to that human resources office and we want to look at some of the things that you've done. because I want people to know what you've done specifically. What strategies have you used to respond to some of the some of the most serious diversity challenges within organizations? Yeah. So first and foremost, I, I give them three steps. Um, and, and what I say is is extremely important, uh, Lamar, is that, number one, people feel empowered. Now, we can look at um, why certain folks haven't spoken up in the past and why some folks may struggle with speaking up in the future. Kind of like this whole vaccine conversation that we have going on right now. Do you want to penalize and really be rude and mean and all that other stuff to the folks that have not been vaccinated? Or do you simply want to just be encouraging and say, at minimum, wear your mask? That's the conversation I'm trying to have. I ain't trying to sit up here and, and force an individual to cycle through their, their process of whatever it is that they got to go through when at minimum, I know we can do this one thing to be better. So I try to say empowerment is one thing that we can do to absolutely be better. Speak up, find your voice as an HR professional and take care of your employees, not your company. Or you can actually do both. Let me correct that. You can take care of the company administratively as you are supposed to policy wise as you are supposed to, but you can also take care of your employees. So number one is empowerment. Number two, strategic exploration. So I t uh, tell everyone that I work with, you should be checking for DNI at every value point in the organization. Human resources is one of those, val one of those value points. Learning and development is a value point. Uh, recruiting is a value point. Corporate social responsibility, a value point. Board governance, a value point. Philanthropic efforts, a value point. We should be checking for DNI at every value point inside of the organization, doing a forensic discovery of what does DEIB look like in that value point, in the business unit and department and teams that fall under that value point. Number two, strategic exploration. And then number three, tactical execution, which goes back to something I said earlier, capability and competency. So if now I'm going to execute, I've spoken up, we've done a bit of uh, evaluation, knowing where we are in terms of DNI in a particular business unit, department, or team. Now we got to execute. So what's the team that we're going to put on the field? What's the team we're going to put in battle? What's the team we're going to send out on the mission? What does that team look like? And we make sure that we got the right team in place and that we're prepared to collect data, to recalibrate as necessary, and to continue on the mission. Where we are struggling is that folks are waning on the mission. Well, actually, we're struggling through all three areas, <laughs> but we're struggling on folks waning on the mission. Look at where we are right now. We are about 14, 15 months post George Floyd. In 2020, $58 billion or so was committed by organizations to corporate, social justice, and racial initiatives. $58 billion is one of the numbers that I've seen frequently. Of that $58 billion, 0.5% has been realized. That's a problem. Mm -hmm. So we got all this money out there through lip service, but from an accountability, from a realization standpoint, 0.5%. Now, your listener, you can pull up a calculator and you'll see that that's a pittance of what we say is important and we're going to put money behind and what they've actually done. So, so what are some of the brands that you feel that have done a good job at promoting uh, diversity and inclusion? I'd rather not call brands because okay. all of them, you know, to some degree, not all of them, even the ones that I might call mm -hmm. to some degree still have a great deal of work to, get, to do. And, and, and in some instances, I may call out a brand 
and <laughs> and they have a major infraction by the time this episode <laughs> is, <laughs> is dropped. So, like, I'm gonna give you an example. Uh, and, and anybody who who's listening, if you look at my LinkedIn profile, my Twitter profile, you'll see some of the brands that I've worked with. I've worked with a brand, major, major, major brand that went through a very public issue in 2018. This is after I've worked with them in 2017 and in the early parts of 2018. And yet by the summer of 2018, spring, summer of 2018, it the wheels was falling off the vehicle because of one minor issue, but minor, major enough where they weren't paying and promoting women, very public. And in that very public let me just say a black man was supposed to become CEO of the company. And in the fallout of this issue, that black man ended up leaving the company, not because he did anything wrong, but because he fell under the gender of man, not exercising that voice, that empowerment that I spoke of, not holding people accountable in the organization. So he was swept up in the controversy and missed being able to be installed as the CEO of this extremely large concern. So when you ask about who's doing it right, I would just simply say the three things that I'm looking for um, to say that we are moving in the right direction is a declarative statement from leadership, at least internal facing, it can be external facing. I want to hear from the highest levels of leadership that DNI, that inclusion and representation, that equity and belonging, are important to this organization. That needs to go out to every single employee in the company. And it could be something public facing on the website, on the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, whatever. Number two, that that leadership is willing to reallocate resources, put money, put headcount behind this work. And then number three, hold people accountable, plain and simple. And the way that you hold people accountable is you don't make it only a chief diversity officer initiative or a C-suite initiative. You hold everybody accountable. What I mean by everybody is everybody. So the janitor inside of the organization should look on their performance evaluation and see a question that says, well, what did I do to contribute to the DEIB mission in this organization? Simple question. And you got to answer that. That doesn't mean that you're going to get docked and pay doesn't mean that you're not going to be promoted. It simply means we are holding our organization accountable. Yeah, one every of the things, single person. One of the things that we typically do in our work is that we ask that question, why does equity matter to me personally and why does equity matter to me professionally? And I tell folks, we're going to do it in real time, but I want you to come back if you need to rewrite it so you can get it down pack and everybody in that space should know that. I love your three prong approach when you talk about it should be in everything. One of the things that I say when I'm coming into a building, I should see equity on the parking lot. When I open that door, when I'm talking to the first person that greets me, when I'm walking down a hallway, when I'm walking through the cafeteria, when I'm engaging students, I should see it every place. I think the challenge quite often is that people feel that we're giving them something extra to do, right? Like are you saying to me that this is a checkoff box? Well, Lamar, give me the check. No, this is not a checkoff box. It should be in any and everything that you do. I was working with a group in St. Louis and they're putting together all these teams. And we said, Maureen and I said, we're not asking you to put together another team. We're asking you to look at your team through an equity lens, through an equity lens. So if you have team A all the way through Z, look at it in a different light because we know teachers and we know people who are working in the for-profit world already have a lot of work to do. But we're just, we want to give you the vocabulary, we want to give you the lenses to look at certain things and we want to give you the perspective that then that you can challenge other people. And you talked about teams. I love the teams. I, I love that you talked about making a public commitment. I think a public commitment to diversity, equity and inclusion is very, very important. But then after making that public commitment, there has to be a private commitment because you may say what well, Dr. Torn Ellis, you're the CEO. That's your commitment. But I didn't agree with that commitment. So when we ask our folks that we work with. Let's just be clear. Let's put it down. Why does it matter to you professionally? And why does it matter to you um, uh, personally? Because, again, I think if you and I were on the same team, Torin, 
and we're in a space. I want to know that up front. It's like if you and I get into a fight, I want to before the fight takes place, I want to know that you can fight. Yep. I want to make sure that you're not going to run out of there and leave me there by myself. I want to make sure because we've discussed it. We've rehearsed it. We practiced it. We worked on we worked on that. Then you talked about accountability. I love this. So accountability is very, very important to your team. So then tell us about a time when you, a torn, were unable to be tolerant of another person's point of view. Describe the situation and then the actions you took and then the outcome where you were just in the space like, listen, I've had enough. You know, Marita and I will tap out. We'll tap like I'm tapping out. I'm walking out of the room. So can you describe a situation when you were deep in the work where you just could not tolerate something that was happening in the space? And then how do you handle how did you handle that? Yeah, let me try to uh, recount this and do it the right way. Real time. So I had a client who um, asked me a question and they were in the recruiting space. And, and, and what they said, um, I'm trying to get it right. What they said was, we can only put, we got five candidates. We can only put forth three. Five, two of the candidates are white men. Three of the candidates are coming from uh, an underrepresented population. They didn't use the phrase underrepresented, but that's what they meant. So two white men, three black, brown folks, LGBTQ, person with a disability, something, three. We can only put forth three people. So what do we tell the white men? I said, you tell the white men you ain't qualified. Or you tell the white men that we've chosen three other candidates. And then they paused. And then I said, let me break the silence for you. If it was five white men and you could only put three forward, what would you, what would you tell the two white men? And they responded. I said, so what's the problem? Why are we changing the language just because we're moving forth three better, highly qualified, underrepresented individuals? Why is it changing the narrative? Why is it a struggle for us to go give this feedback? Why is it arduous? Why are you timid and telling two white men because they were beat out by three underrepresented individuals? Why is that an issue for you? And it became and continued to be an issue for them. It was always something different when black and brown people, when others beat out white candidates. And I shared with the client in charge, I said, look, you got to make sure you start holding this person accountable because they are wrecking our pipelines. They are wrecking our numbers. They are wrecking your employer brand. They're wrecking it because when they are changing the narrative of feedback for these two white men or white men in these scenarios, and they are framing it in sort of us against them or you against them types, that that white man is taking that feedback and I'm sure working it through, cycling it through, processing it differently, and then responding on social media, responding when they're talking to other clients, candidates, friends, colleagues, family, your employer brand is being wrecked by this person in talent acquisition. And eventually we let that person go. Why? Because that person wasn't willing to honor the fact that all we want is consistency. I'm not asking you to lower the bar. Like you're not putting forth candidates that were not qualified. I'm not asking you to lower the bar. I'm not asking you to change the, the criteria that's being used to evaluate anything. So. It's about holding people accountable. I don't need it to be different per se. I do need it to be fair, equitable, and everyone is held accountable. Last thing that I'll say is I try to move and get my clients to understand four strong words, empathy, intentionality, proximity, and transparency. That if you have those four words, empathy, intentionality, proximity, and transparency, it changes your relationship with the DEIB work. So I know out of all the work Torin, uh, that I've done, this is like heavy lifting. I've worked with boys. I've, I've worked with young ladies. I taught, I've taken kids outside of the country. I've written books, I've lectured. But when I, when I parked my car in this space that we're in and I put my emergency brake up and I put my hazard lights on there, are many days Torin, I did not want to get out the car. Um, and in many days I didn't want to get back in the car. 
Talk to my listeners about your process of approaching this work. What do you prep? How do you prep going into the space? And then what do you do when you leave the space? Because I know if you anything and we we have a lot of a lot of similarities in what we do. But this this right here is the hardest work that I've ever done. But I enjoy it more than anything I've ever done. So walk us through your process. So I gave you an example, the crystallizing example in 2011. And just to add some context to that, I, it was a seven figure deal that I lost. I lost a multi million dollar deal because I said I was committed to this work. So the process for me really is about remaining empathetic and absolutely trying to be as proximate as I possibly can be. I'm not a know it all, but I'm a person who is absolutely committed to learning. How do I be better even in this work? And so I'm reading, I'm listening to podcasts, I'm listening to different voices in this particular space. I'm being taken to task about a month ago on Twitter uh, by people from the disability community because of an article that was in the Washington Post that I retweeted. And people from the disability community lit your boy up. They came heavy for me on Twitter and I was cool with it. Like I ain't run from it. I offered some of them an opportunity to call me on the phone. I offered others an opportunity to, to join me and my uh, co-host on Crazy and the King to be guests on our podcast. I wanted to talk about it. They didn't want to do that. So I just want people to know that I'm present in this work. How do I prepare for it? I prepare. Like, I know what it is that I'm doing. I know my space, but I'm still always submitting myself to how can I be better? In 2019, I was standing in a room in Detroit. And let me just ask you this question. Ha ha do you recognize the phrase, you got to be twice as good? Yes, I do. Absolutely. If you were to ask that question to a room of people and black folks was in the room, what percentage of black folks do you think would raise their hand and say they also recognize that phrase? I would probably say 100 percent. Close. And so let me say in this particular instance, one person didn't raise his hand. He grew up in the suburbs of Detroit. <laughs> and so all I said to him, you know, we went back and forth, you know, and we went back and forth, Lamar. And, and he and I said three words. You ain't black. Now, the room laughed. I've already started this presentation with love and process and all this other good. Yeah. So for me, it was just a, it was a short little fun jab. I've been there. I've been there. He was offended. Totally checked out. Checked out so much that he filed a complaint with HR that they wanted me to give back my speaking fee. Now, mind you, they didn't already sent me the video. They didn't already sent me the post event comments. Bring this guy back as a speaker. Learn so much. Talent acquisition. All of the things are off the charts. And I'm not saying this bragging. I'm saying this in a moment of intent versus impact. I had to say, all right, you know what? He was offended. Let me apologize. It's just that simple. I'm not getting ready to go back and forth. Let me do a public apology to everyone that was in the room via video. And then let me do a personal apology for him that they sent to him. And then let me make a donation to a nonprofit organization that he and his family support. And the last thing that I offered was to fly back to Detroit and to take him and his family to dinner. So when we say, how do you show up in this work? I'm genuine, son. Like I'm coming heavy, but I'm also human. And so what I want is for folks to wrestle with what it means to be a better human. The bottom line is cool and it's important, but how do we show up and be better humans in building teams and departments? Well, I know you showed up for this amazing TV show that you were on, this amazing um reality TV show that you are a part of the top recruiter season four. Talk to my listeners about what that experience was like. What are some of the lessons you learned? Things that we things that we didn't see. And and then what would, would you do it again? Would you do it all over again? Yeah. So that was uh, the season that I won, I believe was 2015. And then I was, because I was a champion, I went back in 2016 and we filmed in London and in France. Um, I haven't done any of the projects with that producer and or team since 
2016 because of my schedule in part and in part because I'm moved, I've moved away from doing transactional recruiting and more towards consulting. Would I do some of the projects again? It depends on the theme of the project. Uh, what I will say is that I know part of that is going to be on Amazon Prime if it's not already on Amazon Prime. So folks may not be able to see Top Recruiter because he's changed up his website and you know what content he wants people to be able to see. But I know that he's packaged some of my content or some of my presence in content, and it is actually on Amazon Prime. So what was it like? It was it was for me. It was another day. Just had a camera in 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 the in the process. Like unlike a lot of this reality television stuff that we see now, you can't script me. I'm not going for it. So if I got to be scripted or I have to pretend, that's not what I want to do. I remember one, one piece of the episode, you know, I had called home and was talking to my wife and she was like, you ain't going to say that. She said, <laughs> and my wife don't really curse like that. She was like, uh, if that's what you got to do, you need to get your black ass on the plane and come on back home. And I was like, you know, I knew you'd say that. I said, I just wanted to share with you just for GP. Like, I'm not going to be in character per se. So for me, the process was another day of me doing what it is that I do. It just so happens that we had a lot more people around. We had a bunch of cameras around and we were at a posh spot in, in that instance, Miami, and in other instances outside of the country. But I show up the same way every day, the same way that I'm on this mic right now. And if you are showing video is the same way that I'm on a mic when I'm doing a client engagement, when they are evaluating whether or not they want to bring me in as a consultant, I need them to know who they're going to get. I'm not trying to pretend. I'm not shucking and jiving so I can get a dollar. I told you the cornerstone for me was in 11 and I lost a multi seven figure deal. So if, if I, if I'm cool and I done lost a multi million dollar deal, you telling me you ain't going to give me a hundred thousand dollar contract is like water off of a duck's back. It don't matter to me. You telling me that you can't afford or don't want to pay my speaking fee. It don't matter to me because it's enough people out there that will sign that six figure contract that will pay my speaking fee. So I just show up authentic and genuine. Well, speaking of being authentic and genuine, I'm sure that there's some CEOs that are listening to this show some folks who are running businesses and also some employees who are struggling uh, working for organizations. Uh, how can you, as a, as a CEO, what can I do to promote diversity and inclusion in my workspace? What are some baby steps that I can start right now to start making my uh, organization more inclusive to all? Being unafraid to listen. Step number one. So if I'm connected to that empowerment that I talked about earlier, being unafraid to listen, go on a listening tour and be authentic about being on a listening tour. Don't just do it because George Floyd happened and now we need the posture that we care about diversity and inclusion. Do it right now. 15 months into this, do it right now as we're approaching the holiday season. Do it right now as we are battling with thoughts around, do we return to work? Do we stay in the agile and distributed posture? What do we do about mandating vaccines, not mandating vaccines? Do it right now. Be unafraid to listen. And the reason why I say unafraid is because some people fashion it as a, uh, um, what do you call it? Challenging conversations or what tough conversation, whatever, what, however you categorize it as a leader, be unafraid to listen. That's the first thing that they can do. Second thing that they can do is rely on a competent team. Because as the leader, the CEO of an organization, you do have a number of balls that are in the air, important considerations. I'm not trying to minimize the role of being a CEO. I'm not trying to say that diversity and inclusion should take more priority over shareholder dividends or how we show up in a new geography or this merger and acquisition that we are going through or thinking that we want to go through or a technology implementation that needs to happen. I'm not saying that DNI should take priority and precedence, but what I am saying is as a leader, you should be able to say, A, I'm gonna listen, and B, I'm gonna make sure we got the right team in place addressing that issue, as we got a team addressing that M&A, as we got a team looking and scoping out geography, so on and so forth. As a leader, you put the right people in play. And if you feel like people are not really given proper consideration, 
move some of them chess pieces on the board. Be unafraid to do those two things right there. I love you talked that you led with listening. I interviewed uh, a young lady on my show and she introduced me to a, a concept I wasn't familiar with. It's called gracious listening. And, and when she said it, I was like, man, I love the way that sound when she talks about, you know, listening is much more than allowing another to talk while waiting for a chance to respond. It's it's really paying full attention to others and welcoming them into our our own beings and into our space. If that if that's true, Torn, then what kind of world could we create if we each practice gracious listening? Uh, it would be far better. Like like I, going back to my I want people to wrestle with what it means to be human. Like Cornell West says this better than most. And and he says that a condition of progress is to allow those that are suffering to speak their truth. We still got people. We still got kids in cages at the border. We, we, we have folks that are struggling. I mean, mentally struggling with this pandemic and the anxiety around. I got to go back into an office, into a workplace. When I've been productive, we got folks right now that have reports out that say that over Zoom, aggression and bias has increased. You and I are on Zoom and I find it baffling that folks can increase their inhumanity on a video camera. How do we do and still in leadership, still in shot calling capacity, still being titled a colleague to those that they are infringing and infracting upon. So I think about, you know, Cornell West, I think about just if we apply gracious listening, like we would absolutely be so much better, like so much better. And so I think about, you know, Afghanistan. I think about what folks are experiencing down in Haiti. I think about the dear folks down in Louisiana and some of the other places recently touched by uh, the natural disasters. If we were just better listeners, I think about the the legislation they just passed in Texas. I ain't trying to get your show in trouble. (laughs) But bottom line is when we think about just the voice of people like, are you really being a human like these decisions that we are doing? Some of the things that you all are saying, the reckless uh, persona that you are putting out on social media and political and professional circles. If is that really humanity? Be a better listener. I love that, man. Before I ask my last question, how can my listeners get in contact with you? TorinEllis.com or across all of social media at Torin Ellis. That's one R T O R I N E L L I S. And I use every platform differently. LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, period. Torin, what impact do you want to have on the world? I, I, I want millions of individuals. And when I say millions, millions of individuals to recognize what we are saying around shift the narrative of DNI, I want millions of people to say, I want to wrestle with what it means to be human. I want millions of people to know that love and process are two of the most powerful words in the lexicon. I want millions of people to say, we haven't done enough. I haven't done enough to move this boundary, to move progress in the DEIB space. I want millions of people enrolled as ambassadors, evangelists, and other to say, you know what? We can do a better job of building teams and it's not a zero sum uh, proposition. So that's what I want. The impact that I want is to touch millions of people, not tens of thousands. I ain't that guy that's, you know, doing that cliche joint talking about as long as I reach one, freak that. I'm trying to reach millions of people because I know that my my desire and my mission is around humanity. Well, man, I appreciate you taking some time out your busy schedule and joining me here on Sound, Sound Bombing. Listen, I encourage you to check out his website, doing some amazing work across the country for individuals as well as for organizations. But you cannot leave right now. The second part of the show is called The Super bomb questions and this is brought to us by mountain may the difference between this part is that you have to answer the questions as quickly as possible you ready ready all right here we go what's your favorite word passion what's your favorite quote the wounds of honor are often self-inflicted honor is something that each of us is born with honor is something that can be taken it can i'm sorry cannot be taken it cannot be given it must only not be lost said by morgan freeman in the last night 
What's your superpower? People. What moves you to tears of joy? Family. What moves you to tears of sorrow? Hmm. Inhumanity, racism. What do you wish you had more time to do? Change the hearts and minds of the people that I'm connected to. What is the book or books you given most as a gift and why? The Color of Law, because it changes the color of law by Richard Rothstein, because it takes the conversation around diversity and inclusion into a, diff a totally different direction. It looks at the legal system of our government. And I absolutely want people to understand and have a different relationship with that phrase. Pull yourselves up by your bootstrap. What values do you live by every day? Um, wow. Persistence, presence. Those two. What guides your heart? People. Torn Ellis, if you were in the Mr. America talent competition, brother, what would your talent be? <laughs> Speaking. Speaking. Torn Ellis, I appreciate you hanging out with me in a bomb shelter. We finally did it, man. And I appreciate you just dropping some jewels as always, not only just to me, but to all my listeners that are out there. Listen, go check him out. Listen, this guy is very, very busy. So for me to get him, it means a lot to me. So I appreciate you, brother. Take care. Thank you. And, and I also want to thank my amazing engineer, Alexander Blanc, my super duper producer, Nicole Klimpaka, supremacy for our theme music. And listen, the most important person is you. Thank you for listening. Make sure you subscribe. Leave a comment. Please leave a comment. And if you want to know more about me, go to Dr. DRL ds.com if you want to if you want to leave a comment please do so but listen make sure you do something for someone other than yourself today you've been listening to sound bombing peace the super bomb questions are brought to you by mountain made cbd mountain made is changing the cbd game by offering a line of high dose cbd tablets at an affordable price their products are THC free and third party tested for accuracy, cleanliness, and potency. Their products, which ship nationwide, include Build for CBD saturation, Boost for precision titration, and Recover for rest and rehab. With nine years' experience in hemp and fitness, Mountain Maid's founders are focused on creating a quality product to help those who live an activated lifestyle. Check out mountainmade.life. Again, that's mountainmade.life to find out more about how their products can help you crush life. Remember, their products ship nationwide. Go check out their website today and follow them on social media. At Mountain Made, that's the at symbol M N T M A D E. Our staff at Sound Balming uses Build before our morning workout, which helps to push our bodies to a whole new level on a daily basis. Try Build, try Boost, try Recover. Our staff is using these products to enhance our active lifestyle naturally, and we are crushing life with Mountain Made CBD, and you can too. Start today by going to mountainmade.life and ordering Build, Boost, Recover, or the multitude of other products that they have which will enhance your lifestyle. I promise you, you won't regret it.